Before starting this video, please pause and use the QR code to sign in for today's training. Hello and welcome to the Conflict Intervention and Conferencing Pause and Play video. My name is Jen Vermillion and I am a restorative trainer and coach with the San Diego County Office of Education. This video will be broken up into five segments. Segment one is redefining conflict and behavior. Segment two is teaching the behavior we want to see. Segment three is affective statements and restorative questions. Segment four is the restorative conferencing process. And segment five is closing thoughts and feedback. For this video, it would be helpful to have a facilitator who's designated to pause the video when prompted, keep track of the timing for group discussions, organize the small groups as prompted in the video, and chart the group responses when prompted to. You may also need some chart paper and markers, or a whiteboard will work too, and the accompanying conferencing packet. This video is focused mostly on what we would call tier two and three interventions. So there won't be much focus on defining restorative justice practices or the proactive parts of restorative practices, though we do have a video on that too. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Reframing Conflict and Behavior. Segment one. If I were to ask what comes to mind when you think of the word conflict, you would probably list off a few words like fighting, disagreements, uncomfortable, misunderstanding, anger, maybe in-laws or family gatherings. The first things that come to mind usually aren't positive, but what if we reframed that idea? What if we thought of it as an opportunity? Now, an opportunity for what exactly? Well, we'll dig into that in just a moment, but I want you to consider that when we are in conflict, no matter who's the instigator, there's opportunity to learn, to build empathy, to hone our skills, and to model a better way of doing things. During conflict, we have the opportunity to solidify the harmful lessons that many people have learned during past conflicts, or we can help to restore people's sense of safety and human dignity by the way that we treat them through the conflict. Some of us are unlearning old behaviors. Even in parenting, I've heard over and over again that parenting your own children is a lot of learning to reparent yourself. We have a unique opportunity, especially in education, to choose to model a different path for our students. Even when we aren't our best selves, because let's face it, no one is going to be perfect 100% of the time, but even when we mess up, we can still model what it looks like to take responsibility for our own behaviors and emotions. So what are some things that we can do to restore that sense of safety and human dignity in the midst of conflict? First, I wanna say that this is not easy, especially if a restorative response was not modeled to us. And there can be so much wrapped up in behavior, what we think it says about us, our teaching, what our colleagues think, all the fear-based thinking that creeps into our heads, like if I don't lay down the law, the kids are gonna take advantage and walk all over me, and then I'm gonna completely lose control and I'm gonna lose my job, right? We can really begin to spiral. So here are a few things to consider when you're in the midst of conflict. One is don't take the negative behavior personally. Two, remember that the behavior is teaching us. Three, speak calmly and authentically and listen. Four, create space for de-escalation for both you and the student. Sometimes if it's a minor behavior, that might mean choosing to address it at a later time. Five, be strategic with your language. And six, explicitly communicate your care for the person. This may look familiar to some of you. This is what we call our social discipline window. It shows us what it means to be restorative using these two factors of expectations and support. We want to hold high expectations and high support. The reality is that not everyone is going to be meeting our expectations out of the gate. So what do we do? Do we hold fast to them and let the ones who aren't reaching it fall behind? Or do we meet them where they're at and provide them the support they need to meet our expectations? If we think about it from an academic lens, that's exactly what we would do. Let's say a seventh grade student comes in reading at a fourth grade level. Would we just say, sorry, but the expectation is that you should be reading at a seventh grade level, figured out? No, of course not. We would meet them where they were at and then provide them the support that they needed to meet those expectations. Once when my son was in second grade, he took this wooden egg from his classroom and put it in his backpack to take home. The thing was, this egg was for the next class that was going to be doing an art project with it. The teacher had exactly 12 eggs for 12 students, and when she realized that one was missing, she began to panic. 
So she got all the kids looking for this egg and somehow or another realized that my son had put it in his backpack. Well, I get a call from the school and they told me what happened and that they had spoken with him about how he was apologetic. But of course, as his mother, I'm thinking, well, there needs to be some kind of consequence. So I go through the list in my head. I could take away the video games, TV, time with friends. Do I cancel Christmas? But the problem with all of those is that none of them related to the behavior or the impact of the behavior. So after speaking with him and the teacher, I said, you know, buddy, it sounds like one of the impacts of your choice is that you wasted everybody's time. I'm sure your teacher had plenty of other things that she would rather have been doing than looking for something that wasn't even lost in the first place. So I think the fair thing, if your teacher is okay with it, is to have you stay after school and help give her back some of her time by cleaning her room or organizing her bookshelf or anything else that she would find helpful. So that's what we did. I was still operating within that with box because I held those expectations and the support came through helping him to understand the impact that he had on people. But we didn't need to do that by shaming or making him feel like a bad kid. He was just a good kid that made the wrong decision. And it was an opportunity for him to learn from it. Oftentimes we conflate consequence with punishment. Consequence is a reaction or a response to a behavior. Punishment is finding something that will hurt so bad that it will make them not wanna do it again but they aren't understanding why. They're just trying to avoid the consequence. And if we are helping to raise young people to become functioning adults, then they need to understand how they and their choices are connected to the bigger world around them. Now that we have reframed behavior and reminded ourselves what it looks like to combine high expectations and support, let's put some of this framing into context. In just a moment, you will pause the video and gather into groups of about three to four, You'll take five minutes to choose at least one of the classroom scenarios I'm gonna give you and discuss what would a punitive response look like and what would a permissive response look like and then finally, what would a restorative response look like? Remember that punitive is very rules-oriented, lots of expectations and little to no support. A permissive response is very enabling. It's very supportive, but it doesn't include a whole lot of accountability. Restorative means we still have rules and expectations and you will be held accountable to them, but we're also going to provide the support that you need to feel cared for, valued, and to meet those expectations. The scenarios that you can choose from are one, one of your students is not focusing on instruction and continues to talk to other students for the majority of the class. You've already asked them to refocus and pay attention a couple of times. Then the student asks to go to the restroom five minutes before class lets out. What do you do? Scenario two is your class is generally well behaved. However, there are one or two students that have started to throw paper balls across the classroom while you're referring to the Promethean board. This agitates you and distracts the class. How do you address it? Scenario three, you had a planned absence from class and you had to have a substitute. Upon returning, you find a note from the sub that says your students were being very disruptive and disrespectful, despite you doing your best to prep them for the expectations that you had for them while you were gone. How do you address this? Four, a student comes into class with his hoodie on, goes directly to his chair and sits down and immediately puts his head down. You, the teacher, notice him and see his hoodie still on and that he's checked out. How do you respond to him restoratively? So go ahead, pause the video here and hold your small group discussion. Then take a couple minutes to have a few groups share out to the larger group how they would respond in a restorative manner to the scenario that they chose. Form groups of two to three and spend five minutes selecting at least one of the classroom scenarios. Discuss what a punitive, permissive, and restorative response would entail. If necessary, refer to the previous slides for definitions or scenarios. Let's talk for a minute about misbehavior. Why do kids misbehave? The question that we all wanna know. You're probably all familiar with the psychologist, Alfred Adler. He believed that behavior was primarily goal-oriented, meaning that people seek payoff from behavior. Typically, there are four main functions or goals of behavior. One is escape. They might be trying to avoid a particular lesson or subject because they feel inadequate. Then when they act out or are removed from the classroom, they're getting exactly what they wanted. Two is attention seeking. This might be from you or from peers. Maybe they enjoy the attention that negative behavior gets them from making their peers laugh. 
Three is tangible. This is getting a tangible thing that they wanted. This is the stereotype of the child who throws a fit in the store over a candy bar because every time that they've done that, they get the candy bar. Four is sensory. Some examples might be tapping on desks, repetitive movements, hand flapping or rocking. They may also do this as a way to regulate or when they're feeling dysregulated. All this to say that since behavior is goal-oriented, that means that misbehavior is not the problem, it's a symptom. It's also important to note that sometimes our students won't even be conscious of what goal they're trying to achieve. I'm going to give a few examples of behaviors and I'm going to have you work in groups of four to five and discuss which function the student is trying to meet. Remember the acronym EATS, which stands for escape, attention, tangible, and sensory. Go ahead, pause the video, gather in your groups and discuss which function is trying to be met in each scenario. Scenario number one, Nevea is what you might call a clingy student. She really wants to show how hard she worked on her math. She puts up her hand and calls the teacher's name over and over. When she doesn't get a response, she walks across the room, taps the teacher's arm, and yanks on her sleeve. Scenario number two, Joseph often talks back to his teacher and comes off as disrespectful. He misses or ignores his teacher's hand gestures to lower his voice. Joseph gets agitated when he's told to stop. He argues that he's just trying to get answers to his questions. He believes the teacher should respond to him right away. Scenario number three. Sophia, who struggles with reading, often breaks the rules during her language arts class. She refuses to take out her book during silent reading time. She eventually throws it to the floor, calls the teacher a name, and gets sent to the office. Scenario number four. Ethan tends to be hands-on with other students. It's particularly a problem when he's standing in line. He complains that he feels crowded. He may push other students out of the way. Pause the video. Work in groups of four to five to discuss which function the student is attempting to meet in each scenario. If necessary, refer to the previous slides for definitions or scenarios. Welcome back. Let's take a look at the different behavior scenarios and their functions. In the first scenario, the student is trying to get your attention. She's unsure about her strengths, and she's communicating that she needs your approval to be sure that she's done a good job on her math. In the second scenario, the student's function is a tangible need. With this type of behavior, the student wants what they want when they want it. This function is very common for students who struggle with impulsivity or flexible thinking. The student is communicating that he needs more information to understand the lesson. From past experiences, he may have learned to talk or question the teacher continuously until he receives a response. His behavior represents trouble with communication skills. That means that there's an opportunity to teach the social skill of waiting to talk. And not responding to the teacher's subtle cues to stop talking, he's not simply being belligerent. He's showing that he needs explicit help learning to respond to cues appropriately to have his needs met. In the third scenario, the student is attempting to escape. She's communicating that she's struggling with reading and would rather get into trouble than be asked to do a task that's challenging for her without the support that she needs. In the last scenario, the function of behavior is sensory. Sensory seekers underreact to sensory input or might need more of it to function. Sensory avoiders overreact to sensory input. In this case, Ethan is trying to let you know that he's overwhelmed by being so close to other students. He's literally moving them out of his personal space which may be a larger area than is typical for others. I wanted to show a really helpful resource which is based on the psychology of Alfred Adler and Rudolf Drakers. It's the belief behind the behavior, a key for mistaken beliefs. This image is an adaptation from Jody McVitie. You'll find this chart in your packets. Go ahead and take them out now. To best navigate through the information, start with the feelings that you're having about the student listed in column two. Are you feeling annoyed, challenged, hurt, helpless? Follow the appropriate row back to column one to confirm that the child's behavior is aligned with the feelings that you've identified. If it doesn't match, reflect a little more on your feelings as sometimes there are multiple layers. Once you feel confident that you've identified the right row, skip ahead to column seven for effective responses to the behavior. The other columns either help to confirm that you've identified the relevant belief or offer preventative measures to avoid the behavior in the future. I want you to work independently for the next 10 minutes using the behavior response reflection document. 
This should be the next page after the key for mistaken beliefs. The way you'll do this is to answer the top row of questions on the behavior response reflection document. Then take a look at the key for mistaken beliefs. Find the feeling that you've identified yourself as having and see if you can answer the bottom row of questions based on the key. After the 10 minutes is completed, share your reflections with a partner. Pause the video. Spend the next 10 minutes working independently on the behavior response reflection document. Afterward, share your reflections with a partner. Teaching the behavior we want to see. Segment two. Sometimes perceived misbehavior is really a student needing more help building their competency in a particular area. There are some ways that we can use proactive measures to help our students master those skills. The first thing that we need to do is obviously teach the skill. In order to have success at this, we need to teach it at a time when our students have not broken the rule. For example, if we want to teach students to walk in the halls, the first time we teach that shouldn't be when they're in trouble for running through the hallway. One way that we might do this is to take them out to the hallway and explain that running through the halls can be dangerous when there are so many people in the same space. Then model and give opportunities for students to practice the proper behavior. One mistake that many of us make is to assume that just because we've taught a skill that a student should be able to complete it flawlessly every time. However, for a child to learn something new, you need to repeat it on average eight times. For a child to unlearn an old behavior and then replace it with a new one, you need to repeat the new behavior an average of 28 times. One way that we can do this is through pre-correction. We would use a pre-correction for something that we've explicitly taught before. We would use it immediately prior to directing students to demonstrate the behavior. Now the steps involved would be to one, label the skill by name, two, provide a rationale for using that skill, three, review the skill steps, and four, then release students to begin the assignment. For example, if we want our students to line up at the door in an orderly fashion, we might say something like, okay students, in just a moment, we're going to put down our work and line up at the door in an orderly fashion. Remember, it's important that we keep each other and ourselves safe when we move our bodies. So when it's time, we're all gonna put our work away and each table will get up one by one and walk carefully to the door to line up, okay? Go ahead, begin putting your things away. The table closest to the door can line up first. Another way to reinforce positive behavior is to provide positive acknowledgements. To do this, provide a general praise statement, label the skill by name, and then list the skill steps that the student demonstrated. Remember to use acknowledgements immediately after the student has demonstrated the top behavior. An example might be saying, Thank you, Juan, for ignoring distractions and staying on task when Juan quietly completed his assignment. Or, thanks, Juan, for using the skill of getting the teacher's attention after Juan raised his hand when he got stuck on an assignment. Best practice is for students to receive five positive acknowledgements for every one correction that is given. Teaching the behaviors that we want to see is one of the best proactive measures that we can take. And while there are some behaviors that we can handle in the class, the reality is that sometimes you need a break and you need some help, and that's okay. But the way that we get that help might communicate quite a bit to our students. If we say, get out of my class, and then we hope to have a positive relationship with that student moving forward, we might not be setting ourselves up for success. So we can start with what I call a respectful invitation for support. You might pull the student aside and say something like, I know you are a good kid having a hard time right now. I'm going to invite you to go and speak with so-and-so in the office and we'll connect after. Then either the student goes to see someone else who is told up to have a restorative conversation, and we'll talk more about what that is and what it means in a moment, or someone comes to pick them up and take a walk to help the student deescalate and process what's going on. Then someone should walk them back, take over your class for no more than a few minutes so you can step outside to have a conversation. That conversation might sound something like this. Thank you for speaking with Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. You're important to me and this class is a space where you belong. If I did anything to make you feel disrespected, I apologize. We will make some time as soon as we can so that we can address what happened and how we can work together to maintain a more positive relationship. How about if we follow up to talk more at such and such time? Is there anything that you would like to say to me or to the class as we prepare to return to class? Thanks again for doing the work that was needed. 
Now, you may not use this script verbatim, and obviously you'll have to tailor it to your student's physical or developmental age. But the most important thing is that we are expressing unconditional value for the student, and we are making a plan to discuss what happened. Effective statements and restorative questions. Segment three. Then it's critical that we actually make time for that follow-up conversation. This might be where you use what we call the restorative questions, which are one, from your point of view, what happened? Two, what were you thinking and feeling at the time? Three, what are you thinking and feeling now? Four, how have you and others been affected? And five, what would make the situation as right as possible? These are also the questions that could be used when the student goes to speak with someone outside of the class. That way, by the time that you meet with them, they've already had an opportunity to process their responses. The most important thing about asking these is that we do so without shaming, that we are open to hearing their perspective and that you share your perspective. One way to do this is by using affective statements, also known as I statements. I statements are a way to share how the behavior is making us feel, what the situation is that we're struggling with, and what would be helpful moving forward. This might sound like when you have your phone out during class, I feel concerned because I worry that you're not getting the information that you need. What would be helpful is if you leave your phone in your backpack while I'm explaining the lesson. Now again, this one tool is not going to fix everything. It's one of many tools and should not be used in isolation. Plus, this highlights the need for positive relationship building because if we haven't done that part, then there may not be a lot of incentive for students to care about how we've been affected. Sometimes you might find yourself mediating a conflict between others where you aren't one of the impacted parties per se. And this may happen in class, it may be part of your role out on the playground, in the cafeteria or the library, or as a counselor or admin. This is also a good opportunity to use those restorative questions. In a bit, I'm actually gonna have you practice with those questions, but first I want you to watch this video of a school counselor facilitating a restorative conference between students. By the way, if you're unfamiliar with the term restorative conference, it's somewhat akin to a mediation in the sense that you're trying to come up with an outcome that works for everyone. The biggest difference is that in a restorative conference, the person or people responsible need to take responsibility for their actions. We'll talk more about the process and the steps leading up to a restorative conference and some considerations through the process. But back to the video. In it, the counselor is working with elementary school students at a school in the UK. I want you to take note of the students' demeanors through the process and note the counselor's demeanor and mannerisms. After you watch the video, hold a three minute discussion amongst your group about the things that you noticed. Go ahead and begin the video. Mr. Roberts, can I talk to you? Sure, Amy, what's happening? Well, we've been on the oval and Jack's been saying that I have near. Really? That's no good. Are you alright? Yeah, it's just really hurtful. I imagine it would have been. What was going on out there at the time? Well, we were playing and then Jack started to say I have near and people laughed. It can't have been much fun at all for you. I'm going to go and catch up with Jack and have a bit of a chat to him about what was happening out there. And what I'd like to do is I want to get Jack and you together and see if we can't come up with a solution. How does that sound to you? That sounds good. Amy, what do you want to happen? What do you want to see happen from this? Well, I want him to stop saying I have nits because I don't. Oh, fair enough. All right, well, you go and get yourself a drink of water, calm yourself down, and whatever you need to do to make yourself feel better. Okay. Uh, I'll catch up with Jack and I'll come and talk to you soon, all right? Okay, thank you. All right. So how are you going, Jack? All right. Okay, I'm wondering if you could let me know what was happening out on the oval today. I don't know, nothing. Wasn't any problems? No. Okay. Amy's come and had a bit of a chat to me and she was saying that there was a problem out there and mentioned that you were telling people she had nits. Do you want to tell me about what was going on there? Well, she does have nits. Okay. So what were you hoping might happen by telling people? I don't know. A few kids won't catch them off her. Is there anything else you were hoping might happen? Kids were laughing. Guess it was a bit funny. Jack, I want you to have a listen to the sound of my voice. Do I, do I sound angry to you? No, not really. Good, because I'm not. 
What I want to do is to help solve this problem, okay? What I want to ask you, though, is as you think about what happened now, like as you think about what happened out on the Oval now, what comes to mind? What are you thinking now? I don't know. Guess I shouldn't have done it. And what about Amy? How do you think she felt? I don't know. Sad, I guess. Yeah, I reckon she would have. I think we need to try and find a way of sorting this out. Jack, will you help me do that? Yeah, okay. Okay. So what I want us to do is I want you and Amy and myself to sit down and we need to talk about what happened and see if we can't find a solution, something to solve the problem. How does that sound to you? Good. Okay, well let's do that. Amy and Jack, I'm glad that you both agreed to sit down with me and see if we can't come up with a way of solving this. But the first thing I want to do is make sure that you're both okay. Amy, how are you feeling? You all right? Yeah. Okay, what about you, Jack? Are you feeling okay? Yes. Okay, good. Right. So, I want to recap on what my understanding is of what happened based on what you both told me. And that is, is that you're out on the oval plane and Jack, you started to uh, tell people that Amy had nits, which people started laughing at. Is that basically what happened out there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Jack, the first question I want to do is ask you, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions I asked you earlier. I want to ask you is what you were thinking at the time when you were saying it. What were you hoping might happen? I don't know. It was a bit funny. Kids were laughing. Okay. So you were enjoying making kids laugh, is that...? Yes. Okay. All right. And Amy, how were you feeling out there? What were you, how were you feeling at the time? Well, I was really embarrassed and I just wanted Jack to stop. Okay. Fair enough. So Jack, what have you thought about since? I don't know. I guess I shouldn't have done it. It wasn't that for you. Okay, I'm glad you feel that way. So how are we going to fix this? I mean, what would you like to see happen? I'd like Jack to stop saying that I have nits and for him to know I don't. Okay, so you'd like him to stop saying those things and to understand that you don't have nits. Does that sound fair enough to you? Yes. Is that something you'd be willing to do, which is not say these things in the future? Yeah. Okay, great. Is there anything that you can think of that you could do to make things right? Guess I better say sorry. Do you want to do that now? Sorry, Amy. What are you sorry for? Sorry for making fun of you. That's okay. Do you accept his apology? Yes. Excellent. That's good news, isn't it? Is there anything else that you guys think we need to do? No. Do you think we could move forward? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Are you guys feeling all right with what we've talked about and, and what we've resolved? Yes. Yeah. So we've agreed that you're not going to say those things. Uh, you've apologised and you've accepted his apology. Yes. Does that all feel okay to you? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so the last thing, and this is something that some kids like to do, and they will shake hands as a way of being able to move forward together. Is that something that you guys want to do? Uh, yeah. Come on, shake hands. <laughs> all right, fantastic. Good job, guys. Pause the video now and have a three-minute group discussion about the observations you made in the video. Hopefully you got some good discussion time after the video. Some of the things that you might have noticed was the tone and the manner in which the counselor spoke to both students. Did you notice how the young boy was very closed off at first? And then once the counselor let him know that he wasn't mad, that he was there to help them figure it out, the boy became a bit more receptive to hearing what he had to say and open to sharing and reflecting on what happened. As a note, I'm assuming that this is a school who's cultural norms and climate pair well with this type of approach. If you've seen the intro to restorative practices in circles video, or you've gone to a training, then you've probably heard that the more we do the tier one work of building relationships and community, then the easier these type of interventions are going to be. So now that you've seen the restorative questions played out, I wanna give you a chance to use them yourself. In a moment, you're going to pair up with someone next to you. One person will be partner A and the other will be partner B. If you're partner B, you will begin first by asking the first question of, from your point of view, what happened? And partner A will share a current or past conflict or challenge that they're having with someone. This needs to be something that you can share in under five minutes. Partner B, you will continue asking the remainder of the questions and allowing your partner to respond. Remember, your job is only to ask the questions. Many times when people are sharing with us, we try to relate and show understanding by sharing a similar story 
or trying to show that we're on their side by saying things like, wow, I can't believe that they did that. But we're going to try and avoid that. You can show that you're engaged in listening by nodding your head and reflecting back what you're hearing, but let them tell the story. You are really there to listen so that they can do their own reflection. Now go ahead, pause the video here and find your partner and take about five minutes to go through the questions. Pause the video here and pair up with your partner. Spend about five minutes going through the restorative questions with partner A asking all the questions and partner B providing brief answers. If time allows, switch roles so that partner A can also respond to the restorative questions. Restorative conferencing process, segment four. Welcome back. Hopefully you had enough time to go through the questions. If not, no worries. The main point is to gain some familiarity using the questions and to experience what it was like to ask them and to be asked. When using these questions to mediate a conflict, feel free to reword these questions or adapt them to the students that you're working with. The importance is not so much in the exact words, but in how you say them and just making sure that you're allowing students to, one, share their perspective, two, reflect on the impact of the actions, and then three, brainstorm what needs to happen to make things right. I wanna lay out the process of getting to the restorative conference and some things to consider along the way. Typically, we're notified of the need for a restorative conference through a variety of ways. In the video that we saw earlier, the students came to the counselor. Your school may also have developed a process or included it into your discipline protocols. Perhaps a restorative conference is an option that students can take in lieu of suspension or detention. I was once working with a high school who had a restorative club in which the students involved were trained to facilitate restorative conferences. And whenever a student's behavior or choices would warrant a detention, they had the choice to either take the detention or go to restorative conferencing, which would be held at the exact same time as detention. Eventually, students started self-referring to the program for conflicts that they were having with their peers. Whatever way your site decides to integrate this tool, it would look something like this. We would begin with some type of referral, even if it's a self-referral. Then we would meet with the person most responsible first, and then the other person involved in the conflict. Third, we would meet with any support people that might be helpful to have there. Sometimes support people are parents, a counselor, or outside resources. The role of the support person is to support the students and to provide wisdom, insight, and meet any underlying needs, if there are any. Some support people that I've brought in is a teacher that the students connected with, mental health providers, even someone connected to a career goal that the responsible party has. I've brought in FBI agents, professional skateboarders, and athletes who got to share insights and wisdom and give the students something positive to look forward to. But it's important to note that anyone who is a part of this process needs to be met with ahead of time, and they need to understand the purpose and their role in this process. This phase of the process where you're meeting with people one-on-one -on -one is known as the pre-conference or pre-meeting. The goal at this stage is to help everyone become familiar with the process of restorative conferencing so that they know what to expect. You're also helping them to tell their side of the story and to begin articulating what they need to take responsibility for so that they can communicate that during the restorative conference. So in essence, the pre-meeting is sort of like a dress rehearsal. You will also need to assess at this point whether they're ready to move forward with a restorative conference. The next step is the actual restorative conference. Later, I'll go in more detail about what happens during this phase, but essentially it's the time when all impacted parties share what happened from their perspective. They share the impact of it and how to make it right. The action plan is where the person or people responsible are making a plan to repair the harm that was caused. You'll see examples of this at a later time. The next and final step is the follow-up. It's great to make a plan, but there needs to be follow-up to make sure that it happens in a timely manner. Let's take a look at what happens during the pre-conference or pre-meeting. You'll find in your packets a document from Youth Transformation Center that gives an outline of the steps, questions, and dialogue that occurs during this process. The first step is to welcome the student and build trust. The second step is to build rapport. Third is when you discuss the incident. Lastly, you complete the discussion. It might seem like the restorative conference is the hardest part of this, but in reality, if you do a good job prepping people, the conference goes very smoothly. Take two minutes to look over this document and notice the questions asked at each step. 
Pause the video and take two minutes to review the pre-conference document, paying close attention to the questions asked at each step. We're going to take a look at what happens during the pre-conference. In this video, you will see two facilitators meeting with Derek, a high school student who has gone into a physical altercation with another student at school. In the video, they explain the process and allow him to share what happened. A few things I want you to notice is how the facilitators create a safe space while still holding the student accountable. After the video, take five minutes as a group to discuss what you think the facilitators did well and what stood out to you in the video. So thank you so much for meeting with us today. Um, my name is Justine and I am a restorative justice conference facilitator and um, I know that we we had a brief conversation on the phone and Mariana's here to help guide this conversation and really just let you know a little bit more about the restorative conference process and see if you would be interested in participating. So I can just start off by explaining a little bit about the process. Um, when we say a restorative conference, what we mean is that that would be an opportunity for you to come together with David, um, the other student that you fought with, to talk about the incident that happened and take responsibility for the pieces that you can. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and um, share the impact of the incident on all of you, your, your whole family, and on you, and also figure out a way to move forward. Part of that process also includes um, having mom and dad present and other members of, of, um, that might be a support to you and to David, to the other student, um, so that it becomes a community process um, and a way that everyone that was involved and also impacted by the incident uh, could support each other in moving forward. So I, would, I want you all to know that everything that we say here is confidential. It won't be used in the expulsion process or in any other process. This is really our opportunity to just speak freely about what your experience was and what you've been going through. And um, the only caveat to that is mandatory reporting. So if you know you, if anyone was going to hurt someone else or yourself, then we would have to follow up with that to make sure that you're safe. So Derek, would you like to share with us uh, what happened, uh, maybe prior to the incident and then during the incident? Okay. Um, I have class with David. We were all in class, and, you know, I heard him talking about um, sports. So, you know, I made a joke, and everybody started laughing. I didn't really think it was a big deal, nothing like that, you know. And, um, you know, I guess a couple weeks later, we saw each other in the hallway. We bumped each other. You know, um, maybe I said something. I don't, I don't really know. I don't, you know, maybe I said something. To him, but it wasn't really a big deal. We just kept going our own ways. And then in the locker room, you know, we were all in the locker room. And of course, we were talking about sports, and I made a joke. Everybody laughed again, but I guess he wasn't really happy with that I told a joke or whatever. Maybe he thought it pertained to him. I don't really know. But I mean, so he got mad and said some things about me being black and stuff, and, you know, some really racist things. So, I did what I had to do. You know, I got angry and, you know, we ended up fighting. I want to go back a little bit. Earlier you said that um, when you walked into class you heard him talk about sports and that you made a joke um, toward him? I don't know. I wouldn't say it was towards him, but just, I don't know, maybe if he felt like it was towards him. Why do you think that he would have had that feeling that it was towards him? Um, maybe because a lot of people say that he, you know, he might be gay or something. Okay. 
And and your joke was about that? Yeah. Can you share more details about that? What exactly did you say? Um, I just said, you know, he was talking about playing football or talking about an upcoming game. And then I said, gay people don't play football. And, you know, everybody started laughing. And uh, he wasn't really laughing about that. Derek, I'm asking these questions because these are the types of questions that are going to come up in the conference and that um, others that are there, they're going to want answers to, to these types of questions. So I want to make sure that you feel really prepared for that experience. Um, and we want to help you think through what happened so that you feel really clear too and so that you can share as directly as possible about the things that happen. And the more that you can share the exact words and the exact jokes that you use, the more helpful it'll be for people that are there. And we're having the same conversation with David and asking him to really be clear on what he can take responsibility for too, because it does seem like there, you know, there was an interaction between both of you. I know, um, it wasn't just one person's fault, right? Yeah. So in the spirit of that, if we can kind of talk a little bit more about what exactly was said, because that'll be really helpful to share with everyone too, even though it's hard, I know. Okay. When you saw his reaction did you know then that maybe it wasn't a joke or? Yeah, um, yeah, but I mean, I guess in the moment people were laughing, so I really didn't care. Mm -hmm. and thinking back to that moment, if you were on his his end of it and someone would, called you something that maybe um, hurt you and everyone was laughing, what do you think that experience may have felt like? For him. It probably felt pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple weeks later, we bumped into each other in the hallway. Yeah. And I don't know, some words were said a little bit, and we kept going. Did you see him coming and you you kind of went towards him or how did that look? Yeah, I thought he would move out my way though. But he didn't. And we bumped. Okay. And then what happened from there? Um, um I kinda got a little frustrated with him and I said I called him a name. What was that? Called him a faggot. And it seems like right now, um, saying that word is kind of challenging for you. Yeah. Because the first time you, you talked about it, it was more like, you know, I said a joke again and people were laughing, but the way you're sharing it now, it's like it... Um, there's some other feelings behind that besides it was fine and it was a joke. How are you feeling about that? Um, I know that's probably not, it's not a word I should be using to describe David. And again, I'm, I'm asking you these things because I know it's really hard to talk about, but these are the types of things that um, would be helpful to share with everyone when we come together. And we'll be there to support you. We'll all be there. Um, but this is really the first step to fully acknowledge what happened so then we can move forward in, in a positive way. And then moving towards the, the actual fight 
who do you think, who started that? I probably started it because I said another joke in the locker room. Mm -hmm. Probably. I did say another joke. Okay. What did you say? I said David probably would love playing football because he gets to touch other boys. Is that what being a, a man is to you? I don't know. When, when you guys hear that this is what happened, um, you know, you're gonna be there in the conference as well and have um, an opportunity to share who Derek is and um, what the impact was on you that day that all of this happened. So Derek, now that we've kind of talked about the process and you know really gone in depth about your experiences, are you feeling like you would like to move forward with this process and meet with all the other people involved? Yes, um, I realize I gotta take responsibility for the part I played in this. Perhaps you could start thinking about what you could do uh, to make things better with David um, and repair any harm that was done or the harm that was done. And then also uh, think about what you would say to him on that day, maybe say to his family. And then our next step will be to reach out to David and his family and then maybe some other impacted parties from the school community that witnessed the, the fight. And then we can schedule right now our next time to meet. And at that point, we'll have some updates for you um, after we talk with others. Um, and then we can continue processing this together. Pause the video and take five minutes as a group to discuss what you think the facilitators did well and what stood out to you in the video. Welcome back. Hopefully that video was able to give you some insight on the pre-conference process. When it comes time to gather everyone for the conference, take note of how everyone is seated. It might seem like an inconsequential detail, but it can make a big difference. Notice how in the image, the facilitators are seated across from one another. This is to make sure that the needs of the group can be seen from all angles. Also, notice how the person harmed and the responsible youth are facing one another. At times, the person harmed or the responsible youth may direct their responses to you, the facilitator. If this happens, be sure to redirect the statement to the person that they're needing to speak to. Lastly, notice how the person harmed and responsible youth are surrounded by their supporters and that there's an even number of supporters. You wouldn't want to have one support person for the responsible youth and seven for the person harmed. You'll want to make sure that the number of supporters remains even for both sides. Now I want to walk you through the conferencing process. In your packets, there's a conference facilitator script that gives an outline of the steps, questions, and dialogue that occurred during this phase. We begin with a preamble to help set the tone and welcome everyone to the conference. Next, you have the responsible youth share, followed by the person harmed, then the supporters of the person harmed, followed by the supporters of the responsible youth. If there are any other neutral supporters like mental health providers or anyone else that's there for the good of the whole group, they would share last. Basically, the order of sharing in the group goes from those who are most impacted to those who were least impacted. As the sharing portion of the conference has ended, you'll give a final opportunity for the responsible youth to share any last words or comments. Next, you'll transition to the agreement portion of the conference in which the conference attendees will discuss the ways in which the harm can be repaired. Once the agreements have been decided on, you'll then close the conference. So go ahead and take two minutes to look over this document and the details that are listed under each portion. Pause the video and take two minutes to review the setting up your restorative justice meeting document, focusing on the details under each section. 
When a harm has occurred, often we don't always see the ripple effect that it has. This is especially true for many of the students I've worked with in the past. Because of that, I sometimes like to break it down between how the responsible youth can repair the harm for the person directly harmed by their actions, for the community, for their family, and then finally for themselves. As an example, I once facilitated a conference for a young lady who had made a threat against her school. In the action plan that we came up with, we decided that for the person harmed, which in this case was also the school community, that she would help with an ongoing campaign about inclusivity. For her family, it was decided that they would do weekly family dinners for four weeks. This was because the family was feeling a great deal of disconnect, whereas in the past they had always been very close and the parents were concerned that she hadn't been sharing what she'd been going through at school lately. For herself, it was decided that she would try out for the school's leadership club. This was decided because it was recognized that she had great leadership potential and everyone at the conference wanted to see her using it in a positive way. Now I'm gonna have you watch part of a video of a Colorado high school who uses restorative conferencing as a means to repair harm in their school. Once you finish, I want you to discuss as a whole group your impressions of the video. What stands out to you, what struck you, or made you curious? Now curbing conflicts in high school. Hari Srinivasan looks at a new approach to discipline that replaces suspensions with conversations. In Aurora, Colorado, Principal Matthew Willis welcomes the recent changes at Hinckley High School, where 75% of the 2,000-plus students qualify for free and reduced meals. Willis says student fights are down and respect among classmates is up. Last year, we had a 48% reduction in out-of-school suspensions. When it came to physical altercations between um, students, in 2007-8, we had approximately uh, 263 um, physical altercations. And so far for this year, we've only had 31 physical altercations. Okay. So good morning. Thank you for being here. The turnaround, he says, began when Hinckley High started using a form of discipline called restorative justice. Every single year over the last three full years that we've been doing restorative justice, you see significant declines in defiance, disobedience, and uh, use of profanity. This is called a talking circle, so when we have problems in the school, we come together and talk about it. Now, when a minor altercation does occur, students, parents, and the dean face each other in a restorative circle. Restorative is that you bring back the kids, if it's student with student, or if it's student with staff, you restore the relationship. So if there's conflict or wrong, wrongdoing, we come together and we talk about it and we try to heal the harm that was caused from the incident. So thank you for everything you said so far. And now this is Dean of Students part. Bonnie Martinez facilitates. We speak openly and honestly, but with respect. On the day we visited, two sophomore girls caught up in a physical fight were brought to a circle with their parents instead of being suspended. So this is our talking stick. So who's ever holding this is the ones talking and everyone else is listening. You say what happened from your point of view, and you say what happened from your point of view. And sometimes we don't always agree on all the facts or whatever. She called me the B word, and then, um, and then we just started fighting. That's kind of a layer of you. Okay. She say, to be honest, and I think you have to be honest. I was here, and she come walking to me, and so she started again. Students are asked to talk about the harm their actions may have caused, and Martinez requires everyone to sign an agreement. What do you take responsibility for? What do you think we could do to heal the harm that was caused? I'm sorry for having these problems that we've been having, and I don't want it to happen again. Okay. okay. You're not going to be enemies, but you're going to treat others with respect? That, to some people, may be viewed as a soft discipline, especially if you look at the Western culture. You know, we're about war and violence, we're not about peace and harmony. But however, for those girls to come together and for their families to come together and talk about it and to really, you know, to express truly what happened, how did it affect me and others, what am I responsible for and how do I solve it, that's, that's deeper than just writing up paperwork and one person goes their way and the other person goes their way and nothing was ever communicated. What do we know about anger? It's a secondary feeling. It's a secondary feeling. What is underneath anger? A lot of deeper emotions and feelings. At Hinckley, the restorative justice circles go beyond the dean's office. Peer mentoring classes use role-playing to teach students how to conduct circles on their own. How does it make you feel? 
It pisses me off that he's spreading rumors about me. Like, but it, I didn't do nothing big. Sophomore Nice Smith thinks the circles bring better results than suspension. It used to be like you just get sent home for five days, but that doesn't resolve nothing. You just sit there and you come back with the same anger. When teachers don't resolve the harm by doing restorative justice, then that conflict is always there. And usually what will happen is kids will just stay angry. And the, I don't like that teacher, and so I don't care what you say, and they'll just disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. I'm deeply sorry about what's going on. And if you Models like right. Hinckley's have gained national attention after the Obama administration in January directed school districts to scrap yeah. overly zealous zero-tolerance policies really that led to automatic suspensions and criminal records. Following Such the policies, the officials said, impacted right? minorities at higher rates. <laughs> Colorado's legislature eliminated zero tolerance in schools in 2012. The ideas of traditional discipline don't exist anymore. When um, in the old days, we, when a student or a kid got into trouble, we would spank them. And we moved away from spanking because it no longer met the values of our society. The same is true with a traditional discipline where it's all about punishment, punishment, punishment. It's not about restoring relationships. It's not about taking responsibility for your actions. It's about punishment. And so that no longer fits the society of our future. What, what fits the society of our future is people coming together and working and solving problems together. Pause the video to discuss your impressions as a whole group. Share what stood out to you, what struck you, or what made you curious. One of the questions I always get on this topic is, how do we know if the student is authentic in their remorse? Here are some things that the person responsible should be doing if they are ready to participate in a restorative conference. They should be articulating what happened in the incident and the points of responsibility. They should be using phrases like, I'm sorry, or what happened was a mistake. They should be giving explanations about these phrases to explain why. The responsible youth should be able to articulate possible impact on others and themselves. They should be able to discuss how they can repair harms through their time, gifts, and their energy. And finally, they should have a willingness to put themselves in the impacted party's shoes. If you see signs of these things, then it's a good sign that they're ready. Most importantly, though, is your intuition. Sometimes students need a bit more time to build trust with you and reflect on what happened. And we don't ever want to force a restorative process if we'll end up reharming someone because people weren't ready. Closing thoughts and feedback, segment five. In just a moment, your group will discuss when to use a restorative conference. At this time, your facilitator will take out a piece of chart paper and a marker and make three even columns. For the first column, you'll come up with a list of harmful situations where you think a restorative conference could benefit those that are involved. In the second column, your group will discuss what might be some barriers, either internal or external, for a young person to participate. In the third column, you'll discuss possible incentives or strategies to use to overcome those barriers. Now go ahead, take about five minutes to complete this activity. Pause the video. As a group, discuss when to use a restorative conference and list your answers on the chart paper. In column one, develop a list of harmful situations where you think a restorative conference could benefit those involved. In column two, brainstorm what might be some barriers, internal or external, for a young person to participate. In column three, develop possible incentives slash strategies to use to overcome the barriers. As we come to a close, I wanted to provide some final thoughts. First is start small and run conferences for low-level offenses until you've gained some experience and feel more comfortable moving on to more serious situations. Second, consider using a co-facilitator to assist you. Third, discuss and plan with your leadership how to best implement both informal and formal restorative conferences as an alternative to typical discipline. Finally, some adapting may be necessary, but this process is possible for students of every age and ability. With that said, this process does need to be 100% voluntary. If someone doesn't want to participate, I would first inquire about what's preventing them. Sometimes I find that people are reticent to participate because they don't understand the process and maybe some clarity could be helpful. Sometimes they may also need reassurance that you'll keep the space safe and that no one will be meeting if everyone isn't ready to take responsibility and has the right intentions in coming to the table. In particular, if the person harmed is unopposed to the process but doesn't want to be present, 
They can write a letter or make a video discussing the impact of what happened and what they would like to see to happen to make it right. And or they can have a surrogate victim come in their place. This is someone who's not involved in what happened but has experienced something similar. For example, if the conference is happening because of some bullying, then a surrogate victim may be someone who was once bullied as a child and could speak to how that felt for them. To close us out, I wanted to acknowledge all of the amazing educators out there. And by the way, when I say educators, I don't just mean classroom teachers. If you interact with a student, you're an educator in my eyes because we teach in every interaction. So we're gonna have a little story time. This book is called The Little Hummingbird. Here is the story of the great forest that caught on fire. The terrible fire raged and burned. All of the animals were afraid and fled from their homes. The elephant and the tiger ran. The beaver scurried and the frog leapt away. Above them, the birds flew in a panic. The creatures huddled at the edge of the forest and watched, all except for one. Little Hummingbird did not abandon the forest. She flew as fast as she could to the stream. She picked up a single drop of water in her beak. Little Hummingbird flew back and let the water fall onto the ferocious fire. She dashed to the stream and brought another drop and she continued back and forth, back and forth. The other animals watched Little Hummingbird and they were frightened. What can I do, sobbed Rabbit. This fire is hot and I'm scared. This fire is so big, howled Wolf, and I am so small. I can't do anything about this fire, croaked Frog. My wings will burn, cried Owl. Little Hummingbird continued her work. She flew quickly, picking up more water and putting it, drop by drop, onto the burning forest. Finally, Big Bear said, Little Hummingbird, what are you doing? Little Hummingbird looked at the other animals. She said, I am doing what I can. So with that, thank you for all the little ways in which you are doing what you can for our students. Before we end, I would love if you could take a few moments to use the QR code to complete the feedback form. And remember, this is just the beginning of the journey, and this is just one tool amongst many and only one part of the restorative tiers that should not be used in isolation from the others. Finally, if there is anything that the county office can do to further support you and your school, please don't hesitate to reach out. Good luck on your restorative journey.